So my name is Christian Micheletti. I'm part of the faculty here at CISA, a colleague of Ali. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and share some work that we did in the past few years, trying to give uh, comprehensive perspectives on a problem that is uh, ubiquitous when you are dealing with biomolecules that are flexible, usually densely packed as they are typically think of DNA inside a cell, whatever cell, a bacteria, a eukaryotic one, even of the simplest possible organisms, which are viruses. So inevitably you end up with lots of entanglement. What are the implications of these entanglements for the biological processes of these long biomolecules? And to what extent you can learn about the properties of the molecules in experiments? So you want to identify a statistical mechanical approach to characterizing the entanglement that spontaneously arises in biomolecules. And this is what we have been doing using uh, Cosgrain models and StatMec. And the other flip of the coin is uh, instead of to look at entanglements, let's say knots or links that you can produce uh, in a synthetic way. So instead of relying on the entanglement that spontaneously arises, you wanted to design that. So end up with special type of knots that you're interested in, not the casual knots that you end up in your earphone cords when you walk with them uh, in your pocket for a day and then they're full of knots, but these are statistical. They're usually not the knots that you want not in the positions that you want. So I will try you to give you a physicist and start make perspective on the problem. Probably a good way to introduce the problem and to quantify a little bit what I've been saying in a hand-waving way uh, in, in the introduction is to consider the type of packing that you have of genomic DNA across the spectrum of living cells. So in eukaryotes, you typically have meters of DNA that are packed in a nucleus that has a transverse size of about 10 microns. Then you go all the way down to bacteria. You have millimeters of DNA in a micron size cell. And if you got the lowest possible level, a level to which you can dis dispute whether you are really dealing with living organisms in uh, viruses such as phages, you have microns of DNA in a, a small container, a protein capsid, that is typically about 50 nanometer in diameter. That is for the smallest viruses that you can have. Phages in particular, which are viruses that attack bacteria. So uh, a, a very early view on how DNA is uh, organized at such scales is provided by the beautiful cryo em picture that you see here on the left, that, uh, where people, for the first time, they managed to take uh, cryo em micrographs. So that is, you take tomographic cuts of your frozen viral particles, you measure the electron density, and by taking many cuts along many different directions, of course, from different viral particles, then you can use the theory and computation to reassemble all the electronic structure to come up with an average uh, electronic structure that tells you how DNA is organized on average inside each particle. And as you can see at the bottom, of this uh, uh, picture here, you can see that the DNA is, uh, you can neatly tell, no? you can tell that there are, uh, DNA is organized in neatly loops or a spool, if you wish, that is a coaxial. So it's a, a coaxial along the axis of this viral capsid. However, one thing to bear in mind is that here, what you see is the average uh, DNA organization across many different particles. So you are bound to overemphasize the order, order the packaging of DNA inside. And so really how, how DNA is organized inside each of these particles can be different, can be disordered. That is something that you cannot really probe yet. An indirect uh, insight into how DNA is organized inside, however, you can obtain from a very different perspective. People uh, uh, like colleagues based in Barcelona, in particular Joachim Roca, have been able to develop over the years some very ingenious methods where they manage to get the DNA packaged all inside the capsid uh, of the virus. And then it so happens that if you choose correctly your virus, the two ends of the DNA, of the DNA strands, are complementary. So the DNA is a double stranded, so it's the double helix, but at the very end, it's a single stranded for a short stretch, a single stranded, and the two ends are complementary. So when these ends have the chance to meet inside the capsid, they anneal, they circularize the molecule. So instead of having a linear molecule, now you have a circular one, 
So if you happen to have any type of knots formed in there, it would be permanently trapped by this uh, uh, ligation. And then if you remove the capsid and run the material through a gel, you see the formation of different bands. So this is a technique that is called gel electrophoresis. It is typically used to separate molecules of different lengths. So it works by preparing a gel that is very dilute. So the gel you should imagine as being like a, a wire mesh. So uh, an array of obstacles to your molecules. This array of obstacles uh, presents some entropic uh, traps for your molecules. And ty people typically use it, use it to separate the DNA of different lengths, because if you put an electric field, you know that DNA is charged, you put an electric field at the two sides of the gel, you can make your DNA filaments migrate. And according to whether your molecule is small or large, they will migrate with a different effective uh, velocity because they will be able to negotiate the obstacles of the gel to a different extent. So typically you use this technique to separate molecules by size. But here, though the particles uh, of viruses have DNA of the same length, and still you see different bands you know, in the gels, you can see different spots, they are not separated by length, but what distinguishes one from the other is their topology, is the knot type. How do people know this? Because over the years, people very carefully have cut out excerpts from this gel. They recovered the molecules in each of these bands. They coated them uh, with proteins to make them thicker and large enough to be discernible by AFM microscopy. And with AFM microscopy, people have been able to observe and uh, ascertain that each of these spots uh, corresponds to a different topology of DNA, different knots. So there are very different layers of interesting messages that you can see here. One is that you, and, and I would say the most fundamental one is that you find out that almost all viral particles have a knotted DNA. So the number of viruses you know, that have unknotted DNA inside is less than 5%. Not only that, but if you look at the type of knots that you have, it's a very special type of distribution that is very unlike the one that you have in random polymers in equilibrium, or as I mentioned before, in your earphone cords when you walk with them the whole day. So these topological fingerprints are a robust feature. It doesn't really tell you how the geometry was inside, but it is a reflective of how DNA was organized inside. And it's very robust, you know, topology is, is not geometry, it's very robust. So these are very valuable information that you want to be able to reproduce you know, with the theory and computation. And so the question is, these knots, what do they tell you about how DNA is organized inside? Well, here, I don't want to, you, to, to give you the fine details of a story. I just concentrate on the broad picture so uh, you can understand at least what is possible, what results are known. So the, uh, the, the punchline is that uh, if you create a sufficiently detailed model of DNA, then you're able with simulations of the DNA packaging inside the model viral capsid, which we treat as a sphere, you are able to reproduce the knot spectrum. And only if you get the correct ingredients. And these ingredients are, first of all, excluded volume interactions. Of course, you need to treat your, ch your chain as a thick chain. Then you need to take into account that DNA is very stiff on the scale of the viral capsid. The persistence length of DNA is 50 nanometer. The thickness of DNA is 2.5 nanometer. The persistence length, I uh, remind you, is uh, the arc length over which you pay one kBT in order to bend your molecule. So imagine uh, your molecule is very thin, 2.5 nanometers, and you have to pay kBT in order to bend it by one radian over a length scale of 50 nanometer, which is much, much longer than the diameter, is 20 times longer than the diameter. So essentially the DNA behaves almost like a, steel, a, a, a thin steel cable, no? that is very thin, and despite this, you have to uh, pay a lot of energy in order to bend it over a size comparable to its diameter, really a lot. And uh, so these are two key ingredients, but these are not sufficient. If you want to reproduce the knot spectrum that you see in biological samples, then you need to take into account the double helical nature of DNA, which is such that if you tightly press two DNA strands one against the other, 
they won't, don't want to be at a random angle, but because they have the helical grooves and you have the ch charges of the DNA arranged the helically along the DNA contour, the two contacting strands want to be at a finite angle from each other. If you take into account these organizing, organization principle in, in packaging simulations, then you can match very, very well the distribution of knots inside viral capsids. Not only you can account for uh, the abundance of knots, but you also account for the different uh, relative population of knots. So in this way, you have a validation of how DNA is organized inside. And then by looking at your, by, by looking at your molecule, you can have an idea of how the DNA was actually inside each of these viral particles. Now, a more fundamental question, however, is this one. Since we know, we know, not from the models, but we know from experiments that most of the viral particles have a knotted DNA, the question is, how come that you can afford to have a knotted DNA inside and still the DNA is able to be ejected through this very narrow channel, a channel that is narrow enough to allow only one uh, uh, portion of DNA to go through and not several filaments. So the situation is like, imagine that you have a complicated knot here, and then I want to eject this uh, through an arrow pore. No, I, uh, I don't know if you can see my camera. The question is, how come that I can get it out, the virus is able to eject it without jamming the pore in this ejection process, okay? So uh, if I try to do it with this rope, I'm not able to get this through my fist because here there is lots of friction that develops and the knot tightens, I cannot get it out. How come that we know the, knot, uh, the DNA is knotted and still is able to uh, be ejected from the pore? The, the problem is also relevant for another um, context, entirely different, a technological one. Nowadays, uh, there are um, chips that you can buy that will sequence DNA uh, using solid state nanopore translocation. So the idea is the following, and it goes back to a seminal idea put forward by Deemer, uh, I think at the end of the 80s, but only let's say in the last 10 years, this has become a reality. Imagine that you have a very narrow pore in a slab. It could be a biological pore, but uh, you can do it in a solid state slab. You do a pore with a very thin diameter, a diameter comparable to the thickness of the molecule that you want to study. Let's say single-stranded DNA, just one filament of DNA. And then because DNA is charged, you put a, pot a um, potential difference across the two sides of your, of your pore, and the DNA will be sucked in and will go through. Now, everything happens in the presence of ions in solution. Now, as the DNA goes through, if your pore is narrow enough, you can measure the current, the ionic current that goes through. The ionic current will be modulated by the obstruction of the pore that you have, no? whether the pore is completely filled or it's completely empty or in between, you will have different levels of the current. So by measuring the current, you may have the hope of being able to tell what nucleotide is passing through at the moment. And this is in fact what it can be done. Uh, it, as you can see here, you have as a function of the position of, the, of a DNA strand going through the pore, you have the different levels of currents uh, that you can see. And you can see that you, there are about four different levels of currents and they correspond to the four different nucleotides. The situation is usually a little bit more complicated because your pore is a little wide, is a little long. And so you have more than four levels because you measure properties of two or three bases at the same time. But the idea is the same. By just taking a simple measurement of current without reagents, without amplifications like in PCR, so it's a very cheap technique, you are able to uh, profile the chemical identity of the sequence just by knowing what is the current. Now, the issue that uh, crops up also in this case is uh, what happens when the filament that you're fishing is knotted somewhere, no? because it's bound to be if you have long filaments, and then you try to pull it through the pore. And it's going to jump the pore, presumably, no? as in the example uh, of this uh, forced translocation that I'm doing here. So we got intrigued by the problem and also its connection with the viral case. And so we wanted to study it with models with the idea of telling experimentalists the following. Uh, 
we wanted to identify the length of DNA stretches that was uh, safe enough to be driven through the pore without getting jammed because of being spontaneously knotted. Huh? So if it is short enough, it will not be knotted with high probability. So what is the safest length that you can measure? And let me give you, since you are mostly physicists, let me give you, take this opportunity to give uh, some background, a simple background on the problem of polymer translocation, which is a fascinating problem. Actually, we had an, a hybrid workshop on that for an entire week last week. Uh, it's, it's an extremely active area. So let me give you uh, uh, the, the basics of the physics, because the, I think it is something that is worth knowing about. The problem is the following. I'm sorry, Christian, can I just interrupt you one second and sure. ask a question? So this, uh, maybe you said it, I uh, missed it, this uh, uh, nanopore uh, sequencing of DNA. So the advantage with respect to like the, the already many existing techniques for sequencing, is it just the fact that you don't need PCR to amplify or is there something else? Where, uh, what it's, is a, the... it's very cheap. You don't need reagents. You can do it okay. in parallel. On a little chip, you can have thousands of these little pits that you can draw things through and you can measure uninterrupted stretches of DNA of the length that you want, or the length that you can manage, which has been constantly increasing. Instead of having to chop it up and then put all the pieces back together using a software, which can be a problem in regions that are highly redundant, like centromeres of chromosomes and so on. Okay, thank you. So uh, coming to the problem of translocation, uh, here, what you see, let, let me show you the phenomenology first, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the basics of the theory. Uh, this is a chain. It's an unknotted chain. This is a chain of 15,000 bits. So it's a model chain. There are 15,000 bits, so it's very long. Uh, it is fully flexible. It is colored uh, for, with shades, uh, color shades from one end to the other, so that you can see uh, somehow have an idea of the sequence. And it is, uh, uh, it is charged. It is driven through a nanopore. The nanopore is, is here. It is driven by an electric field that is applied only here, where my cur cursor is. There is not an electric field that goes all the way through the simulation cell, only here. Huh? Now I let the simulation evolve. And then I will play it again, so to point out the, the physics. Huh? Hmm? You see that now we have a globule that is much denser than we started with. Uh, this is not because we have uh, a bottom here. You might think, okay, there is a bottom, you cannot go beyond. No, it's not the case. Let me start again. So this was an equilibrated chain. Let me backtrack a little bit. Okay, so this is the equilibrated chain. This was in equilibrium. It has a certain size and the size of the, of the chain scales like the length of the chain to a power that is, uh, that is called the new which is about uh, 0 0.6 in three dimensions. I believe my colleague, Angelo Rosa, yesterday, no, you, you heard about it when he talked about chromosomes. No? So this is the typical, it's called the metric exponent. But as we are driving it out of equilibrium very fast in the other side, when it goes to the other side, it does not have time to relax and therefore it is much more compact, okay? So this is, first of all, an out of equilibrium process, which is very interesting, out of equilibrium start make, is one of the most active areas of research. But then the thing that you see that is going on here is that you see that there is a longer and longer portion of the chain that gets rectified, gets linear. In fact, this, what happens is the following. The out of equilibrium disturbance that you are applying here at the pore gets propagated through the chain, you know, through the backbone. And it is like when you undo, if you wish, you know, a, a sweater you know, knitted uh, by, with wool, you try to pull it and then you have, uh, you are rectified longer and longer stretches of your molecule until you completely rectify the chain, which meanwhile is translocated. And, oops, and once, once that is fully rectified, it goes through extremely fast. The interesting, the interesting thing, so here I'm giving you some sketches that you can use a scaling argument that will tell you that the time that you need to translocate the chain grows with chain length with a power that is greater than one. So naively, you might expect that if I take a chain that is twice as long, I will require twice as much time to translocate it. No, it's not the case. You require much more than that. It is actually a process that slows progressively down. And this is because 
you are propagating your tension front across a chain that is embedded like a fractal in three dimensional space. And the fractal dimension is new. So you have, uh, it's a diffusion along one chain, but embedded in the three dimensional space with a certain fractal dimension. So it's a complicated process and you end up with this mind boggling result that uh, the translocation time is nonlinear uh, uh, as a function of chain length. This is what theory tells you. And in fact, uh, this is what the simulations also tell you. Uh, you need to be careful in order to be asymptotic, but indeed the exponent that you can see is very close to that and definitely is not a linear relationship. So uh, I try to give you a flavor for the interesting physics that goes on in the translocation process. But the, the point that I want to emphasize is that all these theoretical arguments are necessarily for unknotted disentangled chains, because there is no way that in theory you can use paper and pencil to come up with expressions that generalize to knots. What happens if you have entanglements there? And this is where simulations come to, the, uh, to, to help. And so I'm going to show you what happens when you translocate a knotted chain. So this is a chain. It is knotted. The knot is in the red region. There are, we have developed algorithms that will identify the knotted region for you. Uh, and if, he, if you are not convinced that there is a knot, what, what you can do is you can just pull the chain, you can do a simulation, and if you pull the chain, indeed, you find out that there is this type of knot, which is the so-called Savoy knot or figure of eight knot in that particular region there. So what happens when you translocate the chain? You can try to take your bet. This is your knotted chain or our knotted chain, and this is its translocation process. It goes through, no problem, okay? So when I saw this result, I was very surprised. First of all, I looked at the numbers no, in my data files. And so I thought some, something had gone wrong during the simulation. Maybe we had a crossing, we got rid of the knot for some reason, but no, this is not the case. And in order to convince you of that, I, I'm just showing a close up of the same simulation, but taken close to the pore now. Now I zoom in on the pore. So the knot is initially very up above my screen. And as I start the translocation process, okay, now the translocation process has started. It goes on. Huh? Now you see there is this blob here. This is the knot. The knot was initially far up. And then as we pull the chain, because we have this tension that propagates, the knot tightens, gets at, uh, squashed against the pore entrance. It stays there, stays there, cannot go through, it would like to go through, but the pore is too tight to let it through. It stays there, but you see what happens? The chain is able to slide along the knotted contour and pass to the other side. So this was very surprising, very surprising, in a way difficult to accept. But then of course, if you, once that you have the result, so I'm, you see, I'm completely honest about this. Our initial goal was to tell the experimentalists which lengths were safe to process in order not to incur into knots. And then we found something very serendipitous that even if you have a knot, that is not a problem. Why is that? Now that, now that you have the benefit of looking at the structure, you understand what, what is going on. Essentially, in the knotted region where I was zooming in, the beads are pulled against each other, but to some extent, the chain is not very, very tight yet. Uh, so the forces that I was applying were sufficiently strong to tighten the knot, but the, the, this tightness was somehow counterbalanced by thermal fluctuations that opened up the knot very frequently. And so the chain had enough slack room no, to slide along itself. Now that you understand this, you may have uh, the, uh, the idea, and this is what uh, we were inspired the next, uh, to apply a much higher force. So a much higher force should not allow the knotted region to breathe as much under thermal fluctuation. So the beads would be tightly pressed against each other. And in fact, the knot now does not go uh, allow the chain to translocate. Now you see the knot is tightened. It stays there, would really like to enter and go through the other side, but it cannot. But now the chain is uh, too tight to breathe because we are pulling almost 10 times as stronger than before. 
And now the knot is not able to, to pass because the chain is not able to slide anymore along its knotted point. So at the end of this process, essentially, we can recalibrate our intuition from the macroscopic scale where we have lots of friction to the microscopic scale where the friction is less extreme. And essentially, uh, everything is nicely summarized by this slide here, which tells you that even if you have a knotted chain, if you pull with a low force, it goes through, no problem, almost like an unknotted chain. You pull a little bit with a, higher, with a slightly higher force, it goes through faster, as any chain would do. But then if you start applying higher and higher forces, eventually you slow it down until you jam it completely. Huh? So the more you want, the less you get, if you want to remember this result in a pictorial way. And these uh, can be generalized. I don't want to get into unnecessary details, but this can be generalized, uh, holds for different type of knots. There are non-commutative properties if you have one knot after another knot. The translocation properties depends on the order in which you encounter the knots. There are different knots families. All this is actually uh, not only a curiosity, but it's actually relevant in connection with um, uh, the, the problem that we looked at. Because in the bacteriophages, there are different families of knots that occur there spontaneously. And now we have the insight into wow, why it is actually possible to be highly knotted and yet being capable for the DNA to be delivered through a narrow pore that is not large enough to let the knot go through. If you compute the pressure uh, holding the DNA inside there and therefore the ejection force, you estimate that this force would never be enough to jam the translocation process. So there are various reasons, including the fact that knots are under confinement are delocalized and they are not tight, but even if they were tight, the ejection forces would not be strong enough to jam the chain. So we have resolved in this way a conundrum that had been in the community for, uh, for a while. So let me check how much time. Uh, I, I still have 10 minutes, right, uh, yeah. Ali? Yeah, that's correct. OK, including questions or, or not? Uh, including questions. Including yes. questions. Yeah. OK, so um, OK, I, I guess just to for the sake of having a complete story, maybe I will just talk about uh, complete this part about um, translocation and, uh, and not cover the one on synthetic knots. Um, uh, very recently, there have been some experimental breakthroughs that have allowed the people to use the same setup that I mentioned but with very narrow pores to do sequencing and use that instead to detect in a, with unprecedented details the amount of knots that you have. Uh, why is that interesting? Because the technique that I mentioned here, the one based on gel electrophoresis, has uh, some intrinsic limitations. You can use it for DNA stretches of up to 10, 15 uh, kilobase pairs, you know, uh, thousands of, of bases, not more. Uh, the reason is that the longer is the DNA, the larger are the electric forces acting upon it. And if you keep increasing the size of DNA, eventually the DNA will snap. You know? And so uh, you have to stay below a total contour length if you want to use the technique at all. So people are really blind as to what are the incidence of knots in uh, lambda phage uh, viruses, which have a DNA of 50 kilobases, for instance. So, so this technique would not be good for you. What other techniques are available? Well, zero until about uh, five years ago, but very recently, uh, about five years ago, uh, Keith Decker and co-workers introduced a very elegant technique that uses the same principle of nanopore translocation to detect knots. And so let me tell you how uh, we used Cosier models to complement the insight that you, get, that you can get from these experiments. First of all, the phenomenology. They use a very wide pore, 10 nanometer in diameter. I told you that DNA is 2.5 nanometer in diameter. So these are pore much wider than your rope. When the filament goes through, uh, the pore is partially occupied. So you go down your current level by one notch, and then you go back to the baseline level. Your uh, string of DNA can actually enter the pore in a backfolded way. No? In this way, it starts by the current goes down by two notches initially, then it goes back to one when it is occupied only by one filament, and then back to the baseline level, 
level when it's done passing through. And then you have signatures like this, which I ask you to think about it for two seconds and try to explain. Uh, we start from the baseline level, go down by one notch, so there is one filament inside, and then suddenly we go down by two notches, go back to one and then to zero. Or same situation here. You start to go down by two notches immediately, so this might be a situation like this one here, and then suddenly uh, you, after going, having gone back to one uh, strand, you go immediately down to occupation of three strands, no? go back by two notches and then one. What is happening out of the blue? And the only way to make sense of these signatures is to assume that you have a knot there. And these signatures you find in linear DNA and you find in circular DNA where knots are permanently trapped, okay? So it's, uh, um, you cannot really see the knot, but it's the only way to make sense of such signals. And uh, this technique can allow you to answer a number of very interesting questions. Well, first of all, you, you do counting. You can see how many of these instances you have, which allows you to count how many knots you have, the abundance of knots that you can get also from generator for easies. But then you have other information, like when I had the signal of a knot passing through, when was that occurring? At the beginning of the process, in the middle, at the end, uniformly in between, because knots are expected to be random. And also, what is the duration of this uh, signal that you have the knot passing through? Is it brief? Is it wide? Is it a tight knot? Is it a broader knot? So these questions are all questions that you can answer, at least in principle, with this technique. Well, first of all, regarding the first one, the measure the incidence of knots. So this is what they were able to measure. They measure the spontaneous incidence of knots in DNA of up to 1600, uh, so, um, um, 1,600 uh, base pair, 166 kilo base pair, sorry. And with generator for easies, you are stuck at 10 kilo base pair. So you are about here. So that's an order of magnitude improvement. And I don't think that is really an upper limit, so you can go beyond. And then they saw some interesting features, like the statistics of when you see the signals due to the knot is skewed towards the late, passage <clears throat> late at the end of the process. And then most of the passage events are very short, very short to the point that if you estimate the knot size, that would be tens of nanometers. So that's very tight because the persistence length of DNA is 50 nanometers. That means your knot is much smaller than the persistence length. So it's very, very tight. <clears throat> we tried to, uh, am I on time? Ali, I don't know if I heard. Yeah, so, no, no, you're, uh, you're, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, so yeah. I, I'll try to wrap up in a, a couple of minutes. So we used a model so we, uh, that is quite detailed. So a model that accounts for the double helical nature of DNA and also for the possibility for the strands to open up because we assume that if you have a topological entanglement that may actually snap or oh, cause a bubble in the DNA to open. So we didn't want to miss that. It didn't come up to be a, an issue at all. So this is uh, a model of the double-stranded DNA. So it looks like a filament, but it's actually the whole double helix there with the two filaments. The knotted region is red. You can see what happens. It tightens a lot before entering. So it makes a few attempts to enter the pore. Eventually it goes through, and when it goes to the other side, it opens up. So let me show it again, because it clarifies a few things that were not clear from experiments. This is a knot in equilibrium. By the time that it reaches the pore and then you measure it, uh, the equilibrium properties of the knot are gone. So what you measure, unlike the expectations that experimentally said, are, is not indicative of what the knot was in equilibrium. It's much tighter. There is no way. So by measuring it, you disturb it. So it's, uh, uh, it's, not, um, uh, it, it's not a delicate procedure. And then while experimentalists use currents, we can measure the occupation of the volume, which is about the same thing. So we can measure when the events occur, what is their duration, and what we, we go. Okay. And experiments, so as Q towards the late passage events, we see the same skew. And this is because the propagation of the tension front always tightens the knot before reaching the pore 
at the uh, at the essential crossing that is the furthest from the four ends. And so even if you start with knots that are randomly distributed on the chain, by tightening it, you're pushing it away from the pore effectively. So this is what causes the late passage events. So this is something that you can understand in simulations that was not clear with experiments. Not only that, but what about the size of the knots? Well, we find out that about in half of the cases, the knots are not, were not tight at all. The knots were actually occupying the whole region in the cis side, so the before translocation side. And what was tight was not the knot, but only the tight gathering of what are called the essential crossings. So you see, this is a situation that is very different from when the knot is only on one of the two sides of the filament. Here, the knot really sits across the two in a very uh, dramatic way. So again, this is indicative of the fact that if you measure the signal, that is cannot really be by itself revealing of what is going on behind the curtains. So this is essentially a push for uh, um, to design, if possible, setups, suitable pores of suitable size and geometry, suitable applied forces in order to be able to distinguish properties that otherwise are all lumped together. Okay, so I don't have time to show you the molecular uh, knots. So let me just go to the acknowledgements and acknowledge uh, the people that have been involved in these studies. And I will be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christian. Uh, I believe there's a question already in the chat, Christian. Okay. Um, uh, so Patricio Barletta, if you increase the temperature, you are able to pull uh, uh, harder. Uh, that was back then when you mentioned, hi, hello, thanks for the very interesting talk. That was back then when you mentioned that it was uh, random fluctuations that allow the knot to, you know, uh, relax. Yeah, yes, I, I, I would say, uh, in brief, I would say yes. Uh, um, Maybe I would phrase the answer, a longer answer in a slightly different way, but I think you got the right idea. Essentially, everything is controlled by uh, a dimensional ratio that has to do, that involves uh, the force and the time scale, which is essentially not psi, divided by KBT. Huh? And so it is uh, this ratio here that uh, determines whether the knot is able to breathe and therefore you are able to get it through or if it is completely stuck. Right, and in the case where you are uh, experimentalists that were trying to uh, solve this, uh, in the case where you are in control of the force field, what if you change it, you know, back, you switch it, when it hits the knot, you switch it back, you let it go up, and then... Right, yes, pull, okay. And you pull harder if you do that. Okay, this is an interesting, an interesting question. I think th there are groups that have looked at these... Uh, um, intermittent mode of pulling, uh, if, if I understand. So you say apply a force, zero, apply a force, zero. So instead of having a constant force, you do a square wave modulation, let's say, right. or sinusoidal. So there are groups that have uh, done that. Uh, we have also done it recently, uh, but I think the first group that did it is uh, Shinchak, I think. And they saw uh, that uh, um, that allows you to use, so if you use impulse, that allows you to get the knot through, even using forces that applied at a constant level would jump the knot. Because essentially, when you switch it off, you are precisely giving the opportunity for the knot to, to breathe a little bit. You know? And so the next time that you pull, if you gave it sufficient time, it would have opened that and you gain one inch, and then again, and then again. Thank you. And I was wondering, uh, you mentioned, are these knots present in uh, just bacterial phase? No, 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 of course not. I, I think um, uh, definitely it's, uh, they are present throughout all genomes. And I, the, so uh, I think bacterial phages uh, maybe are not even the first system where they were detected in the first place. They are reported in bacterial DNA, so in bacteria. Uh, th those have been studied really a lot. And now recently, people have been able to uh, devise the technique to detect them in uh, eukaryotes. So I think our knowledge of the abundance of knots uh, in, um, in genomic DNA is just limited by the technological difficulties of, of accessing them. No? So the same group of Joachim Roca has done beautiful experiments. They uh, 
two years ago or three years ago, they, in 2018, uh, you look at there are a couple of uh, uh, nucleic acid research papers, they measured the occurrence of knots in uh, uh, mini chromosomes of yeast, so which is eukaryotic DNA with all the nucleosomes, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Maybe you, if you can answer the next question. Right. Please. Okay. So it is very surprising the knot can be resolved even under low force. I would say because of the low force. I missed some. I cannot imagine how it comes the energy or entropy barrier, the long DNA. Mm, not sure I understand. But anyway, so the idea is that uh, the, the reason, I, I hope it was clear from the, from the video, the knot was not resolved. So it's not that we got rid of the knot. The chain was able to slide along its knotted contour, which is different. And the reason why it was able to slide is because friction at a microscopic level is not as strong as you see in this piece of rope that I'm not able to get sliding anymore at, at a certain stage, you know? Uh, and so um, the, uh, the, the friction depends on how tightly your molecule, in this case, our beads, which I remind you, the beads are not there as physical beads. The, the beads enter through a spherical symmetric potential centered uh, uh, on the center of the beads. So if your beads um, have wiggle room because of thermal fluctuations, each, imagine, imagine a bead that has to slide along the contour. It will feel a bumpy ride because it gets in the way of a very scalloped potential, no? uh, festooned potential due to the interaction of the other beads. But if your fluctuations are larger than the barriers in this uh, washboard potential, it, it will have some friction, but it will still go through. If you pull very tight, you increase the barrier so much that even if you apply you know, a slope, you know, if you're driving, you're not able to get it beyond the barriers. I hope it's clear now. Uh, yes, thank you, it's clear. So uh, the, the sequence slide through the knot, instead the knot, the knot will uh, disappear before it passed through the- Right, right, right. The, the knot was there. It, was not, yeah. it, it, did, it didn't get unknotted. It was mm -hmm. translocating despite being knotted. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I guess Christian will be uh, at the gather. Uh, yes, to this uh, afternoon. With, only, with only one caveat. So I got a uh, commissione for an examination at 2 p.m. So as soon as we finish, which might take up to one hour, as soon as we finish, I will join you on gather. So I will not be there immediately. That's for an institutional um, duty.